All right, thanks for watching. And today I would like to answer a question you may or may not have thought about. Namely, find all the functions f that satisfy the identity f of x, y equals f of x times f of y. This is what's called a functional identity because it's an identity with functions, literally. Before we solve this problem, let's think about a couple of examples of functions that satisfy this just to get our appetite rolling. So for instance, well, the function x satisfies this because xy equals x times y. On the other hand, well, we can go a little bit further. For instance, the function x squares satisfies this because xy squared is the same as x squared times y squared. And in fact, any power function like x cubed, x to the fourth also satisfies this. But there are more functions like that. For instance, square root. So square root of xy is square root of x times square root of y. So that works, and even cube root, fourth root, etc., uh, etc. Et but then uh, also 1 over x, so negative powers work. So 1 over xy, that's 1 over x times 1 over y. And even, doesn't have to be differentiable, but absolute value of x works. Because absolute value of xy equals absolute value of x times absolute value of y. And not even that, there's crazier functions. You can actually check that x times absolute value of x also works. And what we would like to find is the most general formula in this case. And in this video, we will restrict ourselves to continuous functions because for discontinuous, there's some crazy counterexamples, which I'll also talk about. So, and the cool thing is, how do we do this? Well, it turns out we will just um, transform this identity into another one that we already know. So here's step one. Step one, as I mentioned, throughout the video, we will assume that f is continuous. And just now, for the next two steps or so, assume x is positive. Because it turns out if x is positive, it, f of x must also be positive. And here's why. Because if x is positive, then f of x, well, that's the same thing as f of square root of x times square root of x. And by this identity, this is the same thing as f of square root of x times f of square root of x, which is the same thing as f of square root of x squared. But this is a square, so it has to be greater or equal to 0. So in particular, what we know, whenever x is positive, f of x is non-negative. So that's the one thing. But in fact, I want to show that it's strictly positive. Because, for instance, suppose by sake of contradiction that f of x0 equals 0 for some x0. Then, if you take any other x, you get a following not contradiction, but interesting result, then for every x, f of x, well, you can write this as f of x naught times x over x naught, and that becomes f of x naught times f of x over x naught. But by assumption, we know f of x naught is 0. So in fact, if f is 0 somewhere, f has to be 0 everywhere at least for positive x. So in particular, if we exclude the zero function, which is an obvious choice, uh, we actually get that f is positive whenever x is positive. So, and this will be very useful in a second. So conclusion, if, so x is positive, implies uh, f of x positive. In other words, f maps r plus to r plus in some sense. All right. 
Second step, so remember f is continuous and we've shown that if x is positive, f of x is positive. So this allows us to define the following function, namely let g of x be ln of f of e of x. It looks weird, but if you do algebra, this should remind you of conjugation, you know, like h inverse f of h. So where h is e to the x and ln is the inverse function. And the cool thing is, once we have this, we can transform our original identity to one that's more familiar. But just a little remark, why did we need this fact? Well, we know that e to the x is always positive, so by this assumption, or by this fact, we know that f of e to x is always positive, so it makes sense to define ln of this positive quantity. So yes, yeah, step one was necessary. And now let's figure out which identity g satisfies. And you'll see it's a very um, famous identity. So let's calculate g of x plus y. And why are we doing that? Because e to the x plus y is e to the x times uh, e to the y. So then this becomes ln of f of e to the x plus y. And that is ln of f of e to the x times e to the y. But remember, what does f satisfy? f satisfies f of x, y is f of x times f of y. So this becomes ln of f of e to the x times f of e to the y. That's by our assumption on f. And now remember, ln of a, b is ln of a plus ln of b. So this becomes ln of f of e to the x plus ln of f of e to the y. If you know Tina Fe, that is Tina F A. Okay. However, what's so great about this? Well, what is ln of f of e to the x? That's g of f x. G of x plus g of y. So what does g satisfy? Well, g of x plus y equals g of x plus g of y. And this is a very famous identity called Cauchy's functional identity, of which I've already made a video on. And in particular, what is the result? The result is the only function that satisfies this and that is continuous is just the linear functions. So conclusion, of this step, we know that g of x equals c times x for some c. Uh, and in fact, you can calculate c to just be g of 1. And that's in the continuous case. And before we move on, I would just like to mention there are many discontinuous functions which satisfy this. And one has to do with linear algebra. You define a basis of r over the rational numbers. And you just define g to be 1 on square root of 2 and 0 everywhere else. And again, that's in the previous video. And you can. Um, define your function g and essentially will define f via this equation if you want to have a discontinuous example if you wish all right and then what's the next step well uh, we solve for g we found g is a linear function and then we just need to use this equation to solve for f so what do we get f of e to the x that is e of g of x and that is e of c of x, which you want is e to the x, to, the c, to some constant. So what do we get? f of e to the x equals e to the x to the cth power. So in particular, revenge of the cth, I guess Star Wars. Uh, in particular, what we get is an f of x equals x to the c. All right, and that solves the problem if f is continuous and x is positive. So
So in fact, it turns out for continuous functions and x is positive, the only solutions are power functions. And in particular, what is c? Uh, you can actually calculate c. It actually equals to, remember that was a c was g of 1. What, what is g of 1? Is ln of f of e to the 1. And that's ln of f of e. So in fact, we have an explicit expression of the solutions. So it's f of x is a power function, and where that power is just ln of f at the value of e. How cool. All right, now the question is now, we've done the positive case. What about at 0, and what about for negative x? It turns out it's just a, a simplification of this. All right, and now let's tackle the case x equals 0. So what happens at x equals 0? Well, for this, just use the following identity. f of 0, that is f of 0 times 0. And that is f of 0 times f of 0. And that is f of 0 squared. So f of 0 squared equals f of 0. So f of 0 satisfies x squared equals x, which gives us two possibilities, either f of 0 equals 0 or f of 0 equals 1. And both of those possibilities work, but you just got to make sure that f is continuous. So the question is, which one do you choose? Well, it depends uh, on your function. Let's say if f of x equals x, then you would choose 0. If f of x, let's say it's a constant function 1, you would choose 1, whichever makes your function continuous. So the 0 case is basically solved. And then lastly, what happens for negative x? All right, last but not least, what happens for negative x? And for this, let's figure out, first of all, what f of negative 1 is. We'll see why. This determines our sign, basically. And for this, notice the following. So f of 1, it's f of negative 1 times negative 1. And that becomes f of negative 1 times f of negative 1. So it's f of negative 1 squared. But what is f of 1? Well, remember, f was just some power function. So unless we have the trivial case of the 0 function, f of 1 will usually be 1. And therefore, f of minus 1 squared is 1. And therefore, f of minus 1 is plus or minus 1. And it turns out both cases are valid. They'll basically determine the sign of our function. And so now the question is, what is f of x if x is negative? Well, notice now the following. f of x, that's f of minus minus x. And that becomes f of minus 1 times f of minus x. But f of minus 1, that's plus minus 1. So if you want plus minus, f of minus x is just minus x to the c. Which in the end gives us our full solutions. So now we can finally, I can finally tell you all the solutions and draw some pretty pictures. So what is the grand conclusion? We have that f of x equals to some power function if x is positive. Okay, power function. We'll see also other kinds of functions. And then it's 0 or 1 if x is 0. But keep in mind, uh, it's either 0 or 1 depending on which one it makes it continuous. So plus continuous. And it's uh, plus or minus minus x to the c if x is negative. And now let me illustrate what this means in terms of cases. So first, let's do the case c bigger than 1. So think like x squared. Then what does that look like? Well, for positive x, as I said, it looks like x squared um, or x cubed or anything. 
For at zero, well, because it's continuous, it has to be zero. And then for negative things, it's either plus or minus, let's say, x squared or plus or minus x cubed. So looks either like that or like that. Doesn't matter. So that's for c bigger than 1. And then for c equals 1, okay, we, we get some very interesting functions, actually. So for c equals 1, if x is positive, it's just a function x. And if x is 0, it's forced to be 0 by continuity. But if x is negative, it's either x or minus x. And the cool thing is, if it's minus x, notice, we do get the absolute value function. See, that gives us another solution. And then next up, if c is between 0 and 1, Then what it looks like, it's basically the square root function, again, which is forced to be 0 at 0. And then uh, for negative things, you either get like something like this, you know, square root of minus x, or minus that. That would also work. So in fact, there are many such solutions. And then for c equals 0, well, x to the 0 just becomes a function 1. And here again, because we need to, that it's continuous, we can't just say it's 0. It has to be 1 here. And for, um, for the other side, well, in this case, again, since it's continuous, it just means that it has to be the function identically equal 1. Because I guess if you want discontinuous functions, you could define it here to be minus 1. But that's not quite what we want. Um, all right, and that's c0. And then, well, basically for c um, less than 0, then it just becomes like the function, let's say, 1 over x or 1 over square root of x, which is like that or like that doesn't matter. Well, it is discontinuous, but I still think a notable class of functions to consider. And at 0, well, you can really define it anything, like either 0 or 1. Uh, doesn't matter. And as I wanted to say, there are many discontinuous examples. And a very famous one, it's the function that is, let's say, uh, 0 at 0 and then 1 everywhere else. That would be a famous discontinuous example. So, but pretty much those are all the continuous functions they have. And so that's really it for today. So if you like this and you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.